Thank you for joining us for our business planning webinar on the tax issues for startup companies presented by Roger Royce. Okay, thanks very much, Monica. Um, so good morning, welcome. So today we are going to talk about tax issues from startup companies with a particular emphasis on issues that might affect your clients as individual founders or investors. Uh, understand that most of the Wealth Council constituency tends to be advisors to uh, individuals and, and, and also business lawyers. And we're going to turn this on its head a little bit and talk about the issues that you might encounter and the tax aspects in the startup world that you might want to pay particular attention to. There are some things about startup tax, uh, startup company tax that are a little bit different. There are some issues that tend to come up again and again. There are a few traps, little surprises, some surprises, and places where uh, you'll find that it seems that the company tax uh, objectives might be at odds or at cross purposes with the founders and the investors. So it's good to know this stuff. M most importantly, there are several places where uh, the company is really indifferent to taking a certain action, but it might have huge tax consequences to its owners. And I want to mention those as well. So <clears throat> this is a summary of the 12 issues that I hope to hit. Uh, because of the time, we are necessarily only going to survey them at a high level. Uh, I have fairly in-depth research slides, articles, blogs, um, uh, even video uh, lectures on almost all of these topics. You can find them all on our website at RoyceUniversity.com, which you'll find on the last slide. Uh, <clears throat> if you'd like to drill down and understand a little bit more about any of these issues. So let's go to our number one issue that, that comes up in, in the startup world, and this is choice of entity. And you would think that this might be an easy one, but it is not. Um, it is one that uh, lawyers oftentimes give very little thought to, um, but probably should give a little more thought to, because there is no one-size-fits-all solution, although it might seem that way. Now, I will tell you that typically in the startup world, Companies as organized, are organized as Delaware C corporations. Uh, that's probably more for legacy reasons than anything else, but um, there are some good reasons why they might want to do that. More and more, we're seeing companies organized as limited liability companies, LLCs, uh, or uh, S corporations. And just so we're all on the same page, the difference, of course, is that a C corporation is subject to two levels of tax. One level of tax at the corporate level, then another level of tax at the shareholder level when those earnings are distributed to the shareholders. The um, LLC, limited liability company, is and the S Corp are, are pass-throughs. So there is usually one level of tax on the earnings, including the gain from sale of the assets of an LLC or of an S Corp. That's the difference. Uh, what makes this tricky, uh, and there are plenty of subtleties. You'll see I go through uh, on my charts uh, all, the, all the differences. But what really makes it tricky is number six here, qualified small business stock. Now, for federal purposes, uh, not for state purposes in California at least, but for federal purposes, an owner of stock in a qualified small business can get um, a full exemption uh, from tax on gain uh, up to $10 million or 10 times basis, uh, provided that they've invested in a qualified small business, held a, a original issue, a stock originally issued, held it for five years um, after September 27, 2010. Qualified small business means $50 million in gross assets or less. Uh, it meets an active business test. It's not a personal services organization, and there's no significant redemptions. So if that's true, the investor then can get a can roll over the gain from the stock into another qualified small business, or can exempt those gains from tax entirely. That's a pretty big benefit. So that's only available to C corporations, um, not available to LLCs, not available to S corporations. You can get a partial benefit if you incorporate your LLC into a C corp and then do the sale, but for the most part, we're looking at something that. Uh, is available to C corporations it's, and not S corps. However, the S corp has one level of tax. So if we compare these two things, we can say, well, well, gee, if, if we have a C corp with quali qualified small business stock, 
we have a no gain at the shareholder level, but the buyer, however, buys an asset. They buy stock in a corporation that has a built-in tax liability because uh, we don't get any basis step up when we sell shares of stock in a corporation. So the buyer, you would expect, would discount the price they pay for that corporate stock to reflect the fact that there's a built-in tax liability inside the company. In other words, eventually those assets are going to be sold at fair market value and trigger a gain that will be taxed at corporate rates. Contrast that to the S corporation where we can have a sale of assets at one level of tax. The buyer gets a step up in basis. So you would expect a buyer to pay a little bit more because they get a higher basis in the assets. Um, so, that's, so there's a rough equivalence. Uh, not perfect, but there's a rough equivalence between the two. And where you come out on this will um, will often vary depending on, I guess, depending on who you ask. But this is oftentimes a significant, uh, a significant issue, and it requires you to get your crystal ball out and really decide what you think is going to happen in terms of an exit. Do you think that you're going to have a stock sale? Do you think you're going to have an asset sale? Do you think it might be a stock for stock acquisition? Um, you really have to go through that analysis to answer this question. That's the qualified small business stock issue. Uh, I'll tell you where I normally come out on it. Uh, I, I normally come out going with the pass-through whenever I can because I don't know how long QSBS is going to be around. Congress keeps monkeying with it. We already lost it for California purposes. So uh, it's not one that I want to hang my head on and rely on. Uh, I'd, I'd much rather take my chances that we'll have pass-through taxation uh, than QSBS. Now backing up, there are lots of other reasons that you'll see startups organized as C-corporations. The QSBS is one. The, the biggest reason really though is that venture capitalists just won't invest uh, in anything other than a C-corp. Smaller funds will, angel funds were, will, but the larger VCs, they're usually prohibited by their organizational documents from investing in anything but a C-corp. And that is because they typically have tax-exempt investors like, like benefit plans or foreigners that have invested in the fund themselves and their fund documents then will prohibit, prohibit them from investing in anything that would generate either UBTI, that's unrelated business taxable income, for a tax-exempt investor, which would have to be allocated to them, uh, or what we call effectively connected income, for a foreign investor, which again would have to be allocated under their fund documents. So they're typically prohibited. So the, so the way I like to look at it is what I call the go big or go home scenario. If your startup company, if they have to, if they're either going to be Snapchat or they're going to go broke. In other words, they're either going to get venture capital or they're not going to get anything. They're not going to go anywhere. If they need $10 million to launch or they can't launch at all, well, that's a pretty good candidate for a Delaware C corporation, right? There's really no need to incur the cost of two entities uh, to, to form an LLC and then hope we get venture funding and incorporate later and, and um, incorporate later into a C corp if we do. No need to do that in that scenario, right? You're, you're either going to get VC funding or you're going to die. So why go to the trouble of being a pass-through? If that's your scenario, then you're a C corp. And that's what we see most often in the startup world. Not always because we have a lot of companies that they see that as an option. They could go the Snapchat route. They could become big. They could get acquired. They could get venture funding. Or maybe they'll just raise a few hundred thousand dollars or a few million dollars of angel money with investors who don't care about their tax classification or, are, or rather are not put off by a pass-through. Uh, or they do it through debt that is not going to affect their tax classification. So if that's the scenario, uh, what I usually do is I like to form them as LLCs, maybe S-Corps, but usually LLCs, and just provide that they will convert to a C-Corp if we ever do a venture funding. So just keep that in mind. Those are the issues that the Corporate Council is thinking through uh, as they go through this, um, this issue of um, choice of entity. So it, you might see something that looks a little different. Uh, in your portfolio than you otherwise would. You can drill down deeper on these on the materials on our website if you like. I want to keep moving on to some of the other issues. Section 305. Now you might remember from law school that stock dividends are generally not taxable. Okay, unlike cash dividends, a dividend stock is not taxable. Uh, there's an exception 
and that's 305C, several exceptions. And the exceptions generally relate to, at a high level, they relate to a scenario where one shareholder gets cash and another shareholder increases their share of the earnings, profits, or assets of the business. Okay, that sounds a lot like all the shareholders got cash and somebody just reinvested their cash. But uh, that's the general idea at a very high conceptual policy level. That's 305 B and C, disproportionate stock dividends. Well, if you think about it, there's about a million ways that could happen in a corporation uh, that are not very obvious that you'd have to think through pretty carefully to get to. And that's where 305 and the regs there under come into play. Now, in the startup world, we have stuff going on at the corporate capitalization all the time. We've got preferences that are changing. We've got warrants. We've got convertible securities where the conversion ratio is changing uh, or the conversion rate. Um, we have to be careful because these instruments may implicate 305. Now, there's plenty of carve-outs for things like a change in the conversion ratio just to reflect anti-dilution adjustments. And that's pretty common. We see that in pretty much every uh, every preferred stock financing that we do. So that's not probably not going to cause a problem. But some of these other things that are a little fancier, um, that might. The, um, the other thing to keep in mind is you don't hear about this a lot in the startup world uh, for a couple reasons. Number one, it really only applies if there's earnings and profits, right? Because this is a deemed dividend and dividends distributions are only taxable as dividends to the extent of earnings and profits. Most of my startup companies don't have any ENP. Uh, in fact, they don't want ENP. The last thing they want is taxable earnings. They want to just spend all their money to get as many eyeballs on their product as possible. That's how they build value. So we don't really care too much about this. We, we can adjust all over the place and not have a dividend because there's no ENP. If you happen to have a startup that does have ENP, you'll have to think harder about this. And then secondly, again, this is an issue that affects shareholders, doesn't affect the company. So company counsel might not even be worried about this at all, <clears throat> but if you're a founder, if you're an investor counsel in particular, or if one of your clients has invested in one of these, uh, you should be aware that there are issues that arise out of these sorts of, these sorts of adjustments. What comes up most often, though, is in connection with investment units. Now, I'm going to take a step back and remind everybody about OID, Original Issue Discount. And you might remember that uh, Original Issue Discount uh, requires, it applies to a scenario where we have a debt instrument whose issue price is different than its, than its face. So, that's, that, I mean, that's, broadly speaking, that's kind of the usual scenario. And what happens then, is that uh, we have uh, this OID, this discount on issuance, that has to be taken to, into account under economic accrual principles. So as an example, if, I, um, if I'm an investor and I buy a $100 bond or debt instrument from the company for $90, well, I've got $10 of OID in that. And I have to recognize that $10 is interest income over the life of, this, of the debt security. That's OID. Now, where it arises um, in the startup world is we used to do a lot of investment units. It would be debt with warrants attached to it. So, in, so instead of, so I'm an investor for $100, I get back from the company a note uh, and a and a warrant. Okay. Well, what the law says is we have to allocate uh, part of that investment, that $100 I gave, we have to allocate part to the note and part to the warrant. So instead of having a $100 note with no OID and a zero basis warrant, uh, the law says, the tax law says that, no, that warrant's got some value to it. You paid $100 for a note and a warrant, let's allocate $99 to the note and $1 to the warrant or whatever the numbers are. But that's usually the rule of thumb we used to go by. Now you got $1 of OID in that investment unit. Okay, it's a little bit of a trap. Um, it affects the investor, doesn't affect the company uh, in a negative way. In other words, the company can get a deduction, the investor has to pick up income. The market has changed uh, since those old days. These days I rarely see notes and warrants come as a unit in the startup world. What I see instead 
is debt that is convertible at a discount. So instead of getting, you know, putting my hundred dollars in and getting my uh, convertible my note back plus a ten percent warrant coverage, uh, which might mean that I can, you know, buy stock for, you know, I can buy ten percent of the face of the amount of the note in stock. Instead, what we'll get is we'll get a note that converts uh, into stock at some sort of discount. So my hundred dollars will buy hundred ten dollars worth of stock. So those numbers aren't very are perfect, but you get the idea. We don't have notes and warrants. We just have we make it really simple. Note converts in the stock, and I get a little bit more stock for my money than um, than it would otherwise buy. Oddly enough, uh, the law does not require an allocation of any portion of that convertible debt between the conversion feature and the debt instrument. So it doesn't trigger OID. So and that's one of the reasons that we always do it that way these days. Uh, pick dividends, that's the idea. I rarely see this. I won't spend a lot of time on it. Um, but it's the idea that dividends are paid in kind in stock. That triggers, if there's, again, if there's earnings and profits in the company, that means that the recipient is going to have some 305 dividend, taxable dividend, um, based on under one of these exceptions, based on the value of the preferred that they get. Convertible preferred, this is where a company, again, if it has EMP, can get in trouble. And there's a really good example in the regulations where we have convertible preferred stock that's preferred that uh, converts in the common, which it all does, <laughs> uh, almost always. Um, if that conversion ratio changes over time, uh, under those rules I mentioned before, you might end up with some dean dividends. Um, the reason I paused on the OID scenario is because OID concepts apply under 305 as well. So if we end up uh, with some OID because of, of, of a stock dividend, or I'm sorry, if we end up with some dean dividend because of a 305B or 305C uh, distribution, you might end up in a scenario where you have to take it into account under economic accrual principles. It can be very complicated. It's a sleeper. It's an issue that's easy to miss. Um, I think the takeaway here is that be careful with convertible preferred if there's a change in the conversion ratio and the company is profitable or has earnings. Some other scenarios in startup land where it comes up, pay to play, um, probably okay. But you can see how if we vary a little bit, the corporate lawyers change a few words, we may, might add. And by the way, pay to play means that the investor must keep paying. Uh, they have to participate in the future financing in order not to get squashed in their prior finance. In other words, not to get diluted down. Uh, if they don't participate, then their preferred stock converts to common usually, or something like that. Well, you can see that if something like that happens, their interest in the earnings of the company go down, somebody else's interests go up. Um, sounds like if we have any Dean Cash distributions in this scenario, you could have a 305C scenario uh, distribution. Typically not, um, but uh, it's something that I think you have to take a look at uh, and determine on the facts and circumstances of each financing. <clears throat> okay, let's kind of drill down into something a little bit more real world um, and some scenarios that you might see come up more often. Um, number one, formation. So we all know, I think, that the rule under 350, code, sec code section 351, that's what people generally think they're getting founder stock under, <clears throat> says that there's no gain or loss recognized on the exchange of property for stock in a corporation if immediately after the transaction, the transferors as a group own more than 80% of the transferee. So in other words, if a group of shareholders, a group of individuals gets together, they form a new corporation, they contribute property, appreciated property to the corporation, they get stock back in a corporation. As long as that group owns more than 80% of the corporation immediately after, we, are, we have non-recognition under Section 351. Seems pretty simple. We rely on this every day. Uh, where can you get in trouble on this? So number one, this exception only applies to property. Um, and there is a fine line sometimes between uh, property being the intangible property that was created by my services and the services themselves. And sometimes just the way the documents are drafted or how it's timed or where the ownership rights lie 
can be very significant to that that determination. A um, little bit of an arcane subtle issue, but this is something that every once in a while you'll see somebody push up against. Uh, number two, are the rights that are being contributed, do they even rise to the level of property? Um, be careful about this. I mean, typically we don't have a problem with this, but once in a while you'll have somebody that wants to contribute uh, a non-exclusive license uh, that's maybe limited in duration and scope, etc. We've got a, good, a lot of good analogs in the case law um, uh, under the definition of capital asset, the DuPont case, for example. We've got cases that will uh, allow these sorts of slicing and dicing of IP. Uh, the IRS view under Code Section 1235, for example, has been a lot more restrictive. So the area is not free from doubt. And there's an issue there, one to be a little bit careful about. And uh, also services. Uh, we had talked about that. Stock for services is always going to be taxable. We don't get 351 treatment for that. So, so we engage in a fiction here, at least here in Silicon Valley, that people are contributing some, some property, some intangible property uh, that they're going to work on and make great uh, in the company. They're not contributing their services. Those services belong to the company, not to themselves. So we engage in that fiction, but um, you know, I always worry a little bit about how far we can push the envelope on that uh, if we ever get some big numbers and an aggressive IRS agent. Finally, the big, here's a big one, is incorporating foreign branches. And I, I mean, this doesn't happen in the startup world much, but I do want to mention it because the rules have changed on this recently. So the idea is that suppose we've got a foreign branch and we incorporate that foreign branch. You would think that 351 ought to apply. And it does, except there are a couple of carve-outs. And one carve-out is for a transfer of intangibles um, to a foreign corporation. That would be the incorporation of the foreign branch, right? We transfer our foreign division into our you know, European base holding company. That's going to be taxable to the extent of the intangibles under one or two sections now. And, and taxpayers have a right to elect. Under 367A, uh, if it's taxable under A, we would just treat it as a, uh, as a sale at fair market value of the intangible. If it's treated as taxable under 367D, that is what we call the super royalty provisions. Uh, in other words, the taxpayer has to receive a royalty that's commensurate with the income from the intangible that was deemed to be transferred. These are new rules. Uh, it used to be people thought that you could transfer uh, foreign goodwill as part of a going concern value, as part of the business are part of the foreign business assets because there's an exception from taxation for a transfer of foreign business assets. The regulations carve that out and make it pretty clear that, that you're not going to be able to do that without paying some tax. Issue number two, um, and this comes up all the time. Um, Mr. Founder just can't wait. He's uh, ready to go and he's anxious and he jumps the gun a little bit. He incorporates, he forms a corporation, he issues stock to himself, and then he goes out looking for his co-founder. Later, Mr. Co-founder comes along, and they say, "Okay, well, we're going to give you, you know, 30 percent, or 40, or maybe even 50 percent for your contribution." Problem here is, founder number two now has a taxable transaction on that, and they'll say, "Well, why can't we? Why isn't that a 351?" Well, it's not because after the second transfer, the transferor, which is founder number two, does not have more than 80 percent. Does not have 80 percent of the transferee. The corporation has 50 or whatever it was. Now if they had both done this together or if they had both done this transaction pursuant to a plan of contribution, we wouldn't have a problem because we would treat them both as a transferors and after the second transfer, the transferors as a group would have 100% of the corporation. So um, be careful about that one because this is one that you know, we need to be careful about, we need to plan around, and we don't want to inadvertently think they're getting non-taxable founder stock when they're really not. Now, there are some strategies you'll see in the boxes that people use to try to solve this problem. Um, I'll just mention that they come with some step transaction risk. I'm not saying that they all work. I'm saying we do have some good law uh, that we can rely on if we want to do this, but you also need good facts, and enough said about that. Corporate capital shifting. Um, I just want to mention, because if you come to the startup world new, 
you may notice that there is this really odd fiction uh, that exists. And uh, the fiction in the corporate world, uh, we don't have this problem in the partnership world, but we have it in the corporate world. And, and let me give you a really good example from partnership land. So if the company's formed as a partnership, if you normally have a money partner and a service partner, if service, if service partner comes in and they get anything other than a profits interest, in other words, if they get a share of the underlying capital of the partnership, meaning that if the partnership were to liquidate the day that they joined and they would get something out of it, that means they got uh, capital in the partnership, there's a capital shift and that's taxable. That's the partnership rule. And the, now there's an election you can make as to how you value that shift, et cetera, but that's the general rule. In the corporate context, somebody, uh, founder, uh, common stockholder service provider comes into a corporation, they put their nominal money in the corporation for stock, and then Mr. Investor comes along and they put their cash in the company for preferred stock, um, there might be a little bit of shift of capital. Right? If, you, if you were to take a really hard look at the numbers. Uh, but, we're, but that concept is a partnership concept. It doesn't apply in the corporate world. What we're really looking at is just the value of the stock. That the founder was the value of what they got back more than the value of what they put in. And if it was, what's the reason for the difference? If the reason is because of services and they've got tax. Well, I can tell you that I don't think ever once in my life have I taken that position. We always find a way. Uh, to argue that the value of what the founder is getting back is the value of the property they put in, and the services is just a you know is just a, an additional component. In fact, it gets the fiction is stretched so far that we will typically go one more step and say, not only that, Mr. Service shareholder founder, um, you have to vest into your shares. So if you leave within the next three years, you have to forfeit or give back some of your shares, you earn into them over three years. That sounds pretty darn compensatory, but the tax law allows you to do that. That's Section 83 and Section 83B in, in particular, that allows you to make an election to close the compensation element of one of these transactions early on. If we didn't do that, um, we would have a little bit of compensation income every time the shareholder vested based on the value of the stock that vests. And we can avoid that result by using the fiction of AD3B. Issue number four. Um, we are seeing over the last several years a lot of uh, new types of securities. So in the old days, if somebody wanted to invest in an early stage company, a relatively small amount, not enough probably to um, justify what they call a priced round or a preferred stock round or around that values the company because they don't know what the value is and the founder doesn't either. It's too early and there's just not enough money in the deal to do it. They would put money in in the form of a convertible note. So Mr. Investor loans the company money and the company agrees that they will either repay the note or convert the note or mandatorily convert the note automatically on a financing uh, into equity securities issued in the first preferred stock financing, the first equity round and they will convert it at usually a discount to the price in that round. So the early money, uh, they get a little bit of a benefit for putting their money in early. The benefit is, is that the investor now, they don't have to worry about valuing the company. The founder doesn't have to worry about valuing the company. We're just going to wait and see. They get the use of the money early on, but they get to wait and see about the valuation until later. And they can piggyback on to the backs of a professional investor in terms of that valuation. There were some problems with that approach. Number one, if it's debt, it has to pay interest or it's going to be imputed and companies didn't want to pay interest and investors didn't want interest. That wasn't why they were investing. They were investing for equity, not interest. Uh, secondly, notes have to be repaid and there's uh, some securities, some banking, uh, banking laws here in California that put some pressure on making those notes very short term. So uh, these startup companies would almost invariably run out of money and not be able to repay the notes and now they're in default. Usually what happens, because the investor, you know, with a wink and a nudge, even though it's a note, they're really looking for an equity type investment, they would just extend and not do anything. Every once in a while, though, I've seen investors foreclose on their notes and end up with the company. And that was not the deal the founder thought he was getting. So along comes some of these other instruments like the SAFE, which is in effect um, 
they call it convertible equity, it is in effect a warrant that is purchased. Uh, and think of convertible net debt like I just described that doesn't necessarily have to be repaid on a maturity date and doesn't pay interest, right? It just, money just sits out there until the company does its financing or does a sale or some other liquidity. And at that point, it gets repaid at whatever, you know, the rate or multiple is. Uh, it raises a few tax issues. One, if we have an S-Corp, do you have a second class of stock if you issue a safe? Uh, that's a factual determination. Uh, we have a safe harbor in the regs that will actually lead you through that pretty pretty clearly. Um, and is it debt? Should it be on the balance sheet as debt? So uh, these are the new instruments, and they do raise some issues as to exactly how they're classified and also um, how we would um, uh, how they would affect a company's S selection if they're an S corporation. The other way it comes up is that if you have an LLC that issues a safe, because um, like I said, a lot of startups are forming as LLCs. There's a question, well, can an LLC issue a safe? The answer is it certainly can, but it is going to create some tax risk. The reason why is because it creates shifting allocations. In other words, the money that gets allocated to the members maybe should have been allocated to the safe holder because they have the economic benefit. Because if they ever exercise their safe, they're going to get that money. We have quite a few regulations on non-compensatory partnership options that we can look to for some guidance here. Uh, I just want to flag the issue now is that safes and LLCs raise tax issues. Vesting we talked about, I just want to let you know that there is this thing called the dynamic split model out there. I think it raises tax issues, uh, compensatory tax issues. And what dynamic split means is that the partner, the founders, the owners, relative ownership percentages in the company is constantly changing depending on their relative inputs. The way dynamics, I'll go through dynamic, well, let's go through it now. The way it works is we, just like lawyers, the founder has to keep track of their daily inputs, usually on a big old Excel spreadsheet, and they'll value each of their inputs. They'll value their time, they'll value their cash, and they will, um, at some valuation point, they will go ahead and sum up the values of their inputs and take a photograph and see what their relative percentages are. Uh, and that is the amount of stock that gets issued to them. Well, if you think about it, if they're getting stock, that's that's classic stock for services, right? All right? They're keeping track of the value of their services and they're getting paid for those services in stock. I think there's some ways to use Section 83 and 83B uh, in the vesting provisions to get around that result. Uh, puts a lot of pressure on that particular fiction, uh, so just be aware it's not all that simple. Series double F stock to get founders liquidity. Here is what that is. Um, so the typical scenario is founder you know founds a company, it does really well, an investor comes along, investor wants to put a lot of money in the company. The founder says, you know, I think I'd like to take a little bit of money off the table. So the old way of doing that is that the is that the investor would invest and the company would redeem some of the founder's shares. Um, but uh, under code section 302, that redemption might be treated as essentially equivalent to a dividend, uh, which is not what the founder wanted um, uh, back when, um, at least back when uh, dividend rates were higher than capital gains rates. But more often what will happen is the investor will come along and say, we're going to put money in and we're going to buy some of your common stock from you. Um, in, I, in both cases, the, the essential problem is not any, it's not the dividend rate anymore. The essential problem is the founder is going to get money out of the company, uh, and he might give up some stock in exchange for it, but he's going, get, get, he's going to get more money than the stock he gives up, if that makes sense. In other words, there's going to be a compensatory piece. He's getting a bonus. He's selling his $0.10 cents a share common for a dollar a share to the investor or back to the company. And that's compensatory. When an employee service provider sells property at a premium to their employer, that's compensatory. Or their employer shareholder, that's compensatory. There's rulings that say that. So Series FF stock came along to solve this problem. It said what we're going to do is we're going to allow, we're going to issue common stock that converts into preferred uh, on financing, and then the founder can sell that preferred to the new investor at the preferred price. So we don't have this big disparity between 
value and price that creates this compensation income. Um, I think it is generally viewed as a pretty risky thing as a tax matter to do. Some people will come right out and say it doesn't work. Other people will come out and say that uh, it's probably pretty risky. And the risk is that it, the whole thing is just collapsed and treated as compensatory. Um, there's also a risk that what you've got in effect is a non-qualified deferred compensation plan uh, under code section 409A. And that's a real disaster for everybody. And you know, 409A has been around for 12 years now and it just permeates everything, including this sort of structure. Uh, and I wouldn't want to run afoul of 409A. The, um, I guess the final tax issue uh, that comes up with this is uh, is that it also might affect your 409A valuation of your common stock in ways that you might not want. Because companies typically want their common stock to be valued really low for stock option purposes. If you put in place this kind of structure, you might end up raising the value of the common, uh, which would mean that your options are going to be too expensive uh, to be uh, as attractive as they could have been. Okay, issue number seven, convertible debt for S corporations. We just have to be careful in an S corporation. One of the requirements is that it may have only one class of stock. So we're always careful about issuing instruments in an S corp that could be considered a second class of stock. And second class is determined not by voting rights, but by distribution rights. And if that debt, uh, there are safe harbors. Um, and if that debt fails our call options test under the safe harbor, uh, we might have a second class of stock. The call option test would generally say that if that debt can convert to common at less than 90% of its fair market value on the date of, interest, of, of, um, of issue, or if it is substantially certain to be exercised, then we have a second class of stock. So we have to be careful with convertible debt in an S-Corp. All right. Um, we talked about Section 83, um, potential taxation. I think we all probably understand how 80, well, let's just pause on this for a minute because this is really super important. Uh, I think it's well understood, but it's so important it's worth pausing on. Um, typical scenario, a service provider comes into a company, uh, they are issued stock in exchange for some nominal amount of capital. Uh, but also subject to vesting, meaning that if they leave, they earn into their stock over a period of years, and if they leave before that vesting period is up, they have to give some of their stock back. In effect, sell it back to the company at cost. Uh, okay, so the way the law sets up is that if, if property is subject to a substantial risk of forfeiture, which a vesting restriction is, um, it's not treated as owned by the service provider until that, right, that forfeiture right lapses. That happens in the vesting scenario over time as those vesting restrictions lapse or as they earn into their shares. That means that absent any other election, the shareholder has to, the employee shareholder has to take into income the value of the shares that are vesting as they vest. That's not how it happens in startup land because what we do is we make a Section 83B election. Section 83B uh, closes the compensation element and says that the shareholder, the, the transferee of the property, can elect to treat the transaction as closed, can elect to ignore the substantial risk of forfeiture and just treat the value of the property um, uh, as, as uh, you, you know, we'll treat the difference between the amount paid and the value of the property as income. Uh, we're never going to have income. It's always going to be equal uh, on the front end. but. We close the compensation element. That's the important part of this. Now, the, the difficulty is the fact that the 83B election is very formalistic. It has to be filed within 30 days uh, of the transfer of property. Uh, your employee might not even know he has this requirement until he goes to see his tax preparer uh, in April of the following year. So they might not have filed the 83B election. They've blown it. Now they've got these income consequences. Uh, some companies will undertake this obligation on behalf of the employee. Some companies will expressly and quite loudly disclaim it because they don't want liability if they screw it up and they file it late or it doesn't get filed or they mail it to the wrong person or, or whatever. Um, 
the consequence of this falls solely on the service provider, on the employee. That's why it's so important for the council, for the individual to be very aware of this. <clears throat> okay. Um, I want to mention some tax issues around new investment types. We talked about safes, uh, the safe instrument, the keep it simple instrument. Um, so typically when a note converts uh, into a convertible note converts in the stock, we get tacking of holding period. So if we convert the note uh, and then immediately sell the stock issued on conversion, we've got good authority that we uh, can get tacking of holding period and possibly capital gain, long-term capital gain on that transaction. Warrants, it's not so clear. Typically, the holding period of stock issued on exercise of a warrant starts on the date of exercise. So the typical scenario is warrants are rarely exercised. They just sit out there uh, until the company gets sold and then they get cashed out, right? If what's happening is the warrant is deemed to be exercised and then the, the warrant stock is deemed to be sold, well, that's a short-term capital gain solution, uh, which might be taxed at a higher rate than long-term capital gains. There's an easy way around that. Um, if we have language in the warrant that, uh, where do I say it? Here we go. If we have language in a warrant that clarifies that the warrant itself is being sold in the transaction rather than exercised, uh, that warrant itself could be a capital asset that meets the holding period, and that transaction itself could result in capital gains. This is a real example of form over substance. You just have to have the right language in the warrants. Oddly enough, very few of them do, so be careful about that. All right, tax treatment as equity. We talked a little bit about that. Um, so incentive stock options and NSOs, uh, it's pretty basic stuff. An incentive stock option is uh, a creature of statute. As a stock option, there are normally when an option is exercised, the service provider ends up with income equal to the value of the stock they receive and the cost uh, of the stock, the exercise price. Uh, an incentive stock option says that we're going to defer that piece of gain so that the service provider does not have any income on exercise uh, and provide it they hold the the uh, ISO stock that they received on exercise for at least a year from exercise and two years from grant of the option, they can get capital gains. That's ISO treatment. Uh, NSOs don't get that treatment. Um, keep in mind, at least under current law, alternative minimum tax applies to ISO gain as an item of preference, so they end up getting taxed anyway, even though they thought they were not going to. It's one of the reasons I don't use ISOs very much anymore. We just you know, take our lumps and do the NSOs instead. Other types of comp compensation you might hear people talk about. Restricted stock, that's just a sale of stock rather than a grant of an option. Trouble with options is that you have to have valuations um, in order to comply or, uh, well, in order to fit a safe harbor under code section 409A. So 409A came into the code 12 years ago. That provides that deferred compensation is going to be subject to taxes, penalties, and interest unless it complies with the requirements of 409A, which generally require fixed distribution dates or fixed amounts uh, or fixed formula for determining those. So stock options uh, are deferred comp, right? Because you're you're pay, you're you're getting something now that's going to pay you off uh, for services rendered this year. That's going to pay you off in the future year. That's deferred comp. That's the definition of deferred comp, mm -hmm. and they would normally um, not qualify under 409A because we don't have a fixed date of distribution or a fixed amount, except for an exception in the code uh, for uh, compensatory stock option plans on common stock. Be careful, not on preferred, but on common stock. In order to qualify for that exception, the strike price of the option has to be fair market value. We establish that through evaluation. If you don't get a professional valuation, any later acquirer or financier is probably not going to accept whatever value you put on it. So we establish it through valuation, and that fits a, a safe harbor uh, so the companies don't have to worry about these significant penalties, which fall on the employee, by the way. It's a big cost. Companies don't want to deal with it. So instead, what they might do is just issue restricted stock. Instead of an option that vests over three years to buy stock in a company, They'll just issue stock that vests over three years. 
That works just fine. Do that all the time. We do not have a 409A issue with the issuance of restricted stock. That's not deferred comp, like an option is. It's restricted stock units. Um, I never see those in the startup world. That's really just a promise to grant somebody stock in the future uh, that nests over time. Uh, they have income when the stock investor is granted. So we're just deferring the issue. And now they've got, non, in the startup world, it doesn't work because they have you know, taxation on the value of non-liquid stock, uh, not cash, uh, even though they don't have cash to pay the tax. So you'll see that in public companies maybe, but not in startups. Phantom stock we see a lot of in startups. And the idea behind phantom stock is that it's not stock at all. It's a bonus plan. Uh, in order for it to work real well, we want it to be entirely contingent on the employee's service to the company and their rights under the plan to terminate uh, when the company leaves. And that makes sense because we have this plan in order to retain and incentivize key employees, not to incentivize people to leave and sit around and wait for a payday. So that's phantom stock. Uh, if uh, somebody decides that they want the phantom stock to act more like real stock, in other words, that the employee can leave but hang on to his phantom stock benefit, I think then we've got deferred comp and we've got to run the gauntlet to 409A again. So we see a lot of phantom stock, we see a lot of restricted stock. Never see employee stock purchase plans in a, in a startup, and I never see restricted stock units. Partial recourse debt, just briefly because we're coming to the end of my time here. Uh, the scenario is, is that Mr. Founder says, well, you know, I'd like to get my equity in the company. You've convinced me that under 351A, I can't do it tax-free. I'm coming in too late. Um, but I don't want to get just an option grant because when I exercise that option or when I cash it out, I'm going to have ordinary income because it's way too big to be an ISO. Uh, and I don't want restricted stocks. So I don't want to have to pay for it and come out of pocket for cash to buy the stock now. If I don't buy it and I've got compensation equal to the value of the stock granted to me, that's not a very good result. I either got to pay cash or I got to pay tax. Uh, how about I buy the stock on a note? And we do that a lot. So Mr. New Employee writes the company a note and they get the stock. Now, um, the one thing everybody probably goes through once in their career, but hopefully not more than that, is that scenario where the company changes management, it doesn't do very well, and a, maybe a trustee in bankruptcy or somebody comes along and they view that note as an asset and they start suing employees on their notes. It's pretty ugly. So we don't want that to happen. So people will say, well, let's make it a non-recourse note. In other words, it's secured by the stock, but I'm not personally liable. Well, if you do that, the IRS's view is that you don't have a sale of stock at all. You have an option because it operates exactly like an option. You don't have the stock until you actually make a payment on the note. And by the way, when you do make that payment at that point, uh, you might have a bargain sale, you might have compensation income if the stock's appreciated in value. So the solution is a partial recourse note. We give it enough recourse to make it a true sale so that the service provider is treated as the owner for capital gains purposes. Uh, but we don't give it so much recourse that it gives them more liability than they might want to undertake. So 51% is our rule of thumb because it's startup company stock. If it were something else, we might have a lower rule of thumb. Uh, but if they can do 51%, we all feel pretty comfortable that they've got an actual sale and are the owner of the stock. Partnership interests, I just want to mention that this vesting stuff I'm talking about in the corporate world, we're seeing more and more LLC startups organized as LLC. Works really well in the corporate world. We've got plenty of law and regs and statutes. Doesn't work so well in the partnership world because we've got a problem with shifting our transitory allocations. Here's what I mean by that. Uh, if I'm the owner of an unvested interest in a partnership, uh, I get an allocation of income from the partnership, uh, but then I leave and I invest and I have to give my unvested shares back to the company. Well, that allocation of income to me is now has to be, it's been forfeited. I don't have that anymore. Um, that's a contingent allocation and it might affect your uh, your 704, they call them 704B allocations, meaning that the IRS doesn't have to respect it. They can go in and reallocate income in accordance with the partner's interest in the partnership. Uh, I'm not saying that's the answer. I'm saying that's an ambiguity that is created by unvested interest in LLCs. So incorporation of an LLC, let me give you what, let me cut to the chase here. Uh, 
like I say, my favorite scenario is to start off with an LLC and then incorporate it down the road, turn it into uh, a corporation when we have a, an institutional investor come along. That's super easy to do as a corporate law matter. Sometimes you have to do a merger. Sometimes you can do a formless conversion, just file a one-page document. It's a corporate matter, very easy. It's a tax matter, very complex. Um, first of all, we have to figure out what type of incorporation is it. Um, are the assets moving over? Uh, let me show you here. Um, this is an assets over incorporation. Uh, old LLC moves assets to NUCO in exchange for stock, then distributes stock in liquidation. Uh, is it an assets up deal where old LLC distributes assets up to its members and the members contribute the assets to NUCO in exchange for NUCO stock? Or is it an interest over uh, transaction, which actually has to be done uh, through, through the documents, not through a formless conversion. The consequences of doing all of these is a little bit different uh, in each of those. That's not what I want to really tell you about. What I really want to tell you about is how it can trigger income. Um, so if you have a typical startup LLC where the company uh, has gone out and borrowed a bunch of money in order to fund, um, in order to fund its operations, uh, well, now people will necessarily have gone negative in their capital accounts is one way of looking at it. Uh, in other words, they're going to take deductions in excess of the cash they put into the company because they are deemed to have a share of the liability of the LLC. That's partnership tax law. When they incorporate, um, that, sh that, that shifts. And under a couple of different provisions, 351 is one of them, um, um, 752 is another one, but what you end up having happen is that they recapture into income the amount of deductions they took in excess of cash they contributed. That can be a real bad, that could be a really, really bad answer. So we want to be careful about that. Uh, there's ways around it. There's ways to plan into it. The important thing is to be aware of it. <clears throat> so at this point, I want to let people know that the attendance verification code is 00HM1, OOHM1. 409A, uh, like I say, it's everywhere. We talked about it already. We talked about it, how it comes up in the uh, start in the option context, and we've talked about how it comes up in some other scenarios. Uh, where it comes up in the third scenario in startup land is you'll have founders that will get the idea that, gee, I've been doing a lot of work for this company. I haven't been paid. I'm just getting sweat equity. You know, I think I should get paid. Uh, when we get financed, so they put a little resolution in place that says resolve company will pay me my you know X dollars uh, upon a close of a financing. Does that work? Um, so the problem is that that is a plan of deferred compensation as defined by 409A. It services in one year, payment in another year. And question number two, does it run the gauntlet? Well, it can uh, if it qualifies under a couple of different exceptions, one being the short-term deferral exception, meaning it has to be paid by March 15th of the next year. If your resolution doesn't say that, you don't qualify for short-term deferral. Uh, uh, there is some thought that it's because it's contingent on that financing event, that might be good enough. Um, but what probably isn't good enough is people probably haven't put enough thought into this uh, to create a written plan of, of uh, deferred comp. Um, and it's just not clear whether, uh, I don't think that's a permissible payment event, let me put it that way, because we don't know when that's going to happen. Uh, and if it's pretty much certain to happen uh, at some point in the future, I don't know, I think we might have deferred comp. I don't like to do it that way. Uh, I like to structure this in a way that we know is going to hit short-term deferral. Uh, or it's going to say something that, uh, you know, it's payable down the road and, and uh, it, it, you know, if we don't do a financing by this time next year, then it's not payable. Something like that, uh, again, this is, a, this is this could take a lot of different forms, you just need to be aware of the issue. Here's a good little chart that will give you all the rules on, um, you know, what, what your risk is and how we can probably deal with it. Number 10, employee versus independent contractor. This comes up all the time. Uh, it's, uh, I, will just, I will just tell you that this, is a, this could be a, a Chernobyl-sized fire for a company. Uh, it could tank a company. 
uh, if they misclassify their employees. We have to be very careful, err on the side of tax employees. Uh, otherwise, the employer, the company ends up being responsible for the taxes that the employee should have paid. Uh, just Google HomeJoy and you'll see how bad this can get uh, in the startup world. Uh, these regs are they're likely going to go away if they haven't already, but they don't apply to S corporations anyway. So they're not that relevant in the startup world. We thought they might be when they came out. That's the debt equity regulations. The last thing I want to mention in the time I have is the PATH Act. Uh, it used to be that the R&D credit was something that was fun to think about and talk about and even use if you're a bigger company and you've got a lot of income uh, and a lot of income tax that you needed to be credited. But if you're one of my little startup companies that operates on losses and doesn't have any income or income tax, you know, who cares about R&D credits? Well, since 2015, every startup should care because they can take that credit not only against income tax, but also against payroll taxes. That's a huge benefit. That's a huge benefit. And the change is that it's caused every startup company now to go talk to pay to R&D tax specialists when we never did before. Okay, uh, and that is it for my presentation. I would invite you folks, if you want to learn any more about any of these topics, to go ahead and log into Royce University or the Royce Law Education Hub. You'll find articles, slides, uh, lectures, presentations. Uh, we drill down deeply on, on all of these issues. This is what we do day in and day out here in Silicon Valley. So I, I welcome you to sign up to our newsletter, visit our website, uh, join our events, and I hope to see you soon.